was point number seven here on our document, our category of walking, to walk worthy of the Lord. And our point says, the filling of the Holy Spirit glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we walk in the bottom circle, when we make progress in our spiritual life, we glorify God. But I want to bring it back down to a very, very simple application. We have to look at the life of Jesus Christ. When Jesus lived on earth, he had a goal. Jesus began his three-year ministry, and he taught, preached throughout the land. He evangelized. He had many followers. But at the end of his ministry, he recognized the Jewish people as a whole did not accept him as Messiah. And so he recognized the Father's plan was for him to go to the cross and so Jesus, probably in the morning and much like this morning, a little cool, still in the darkness of night, was arrested. He was betrayed into the hands of sinners. He was treated very roughly. Jesus would say to the people who arrested him, Why did you not arrest me in the daytime? I've been out teaching. You come to me like a common criminal. He was tied, he was bound, and he was beaten. Jesus went through the court system, the only honest and just man who ever lived without sin, and yet somehow he was condemned by the justice system of the time. He was beaten in the face, he was spat upon, he was actually impaled with a crown of thorns. And then he was beaten with a staff. Jesus also endured the cat of nine tails, where he took 40 stripes, 40 licks, with a whip, where the flesh of his back was literally stripped from his body. And then after this, he drug across as far as his physical strength would allow him towards the hill of Golgotha. And he made one step after another under great pressure and great adversity, knowing the closer he got to that hill, the more painful it became. And not only that, that once he mounted that cross, that the worst thing that had ever happened to a member of the human race was about to happen. And Jesus put one foot in front of the other. He kept walking. He had a goal. He had a purpose in life. Nothing, nothing not even all hell, Satanic attack could keep him from walking, walking up that hill and mounting that cross. And so the application here for each of us as Christians, you can get this as a baby believer. We must have a goal in our Christian lives. And we must put one foot in front of the other. And we must go towards the goal. And we must have a purpose. But we must not stop. We must not quit. We must continue in God's plan. We must walk with purpose. When we walk with purpose towards that goal, which is our goal is to be like Christ, we glorify the Lord. And we put one foot in front of the other. And to walk worthy of the Lord is to look at your spiritual life and say to yourself, I know I haven't made it yet, but I'm willing, God. I am willing to put one foot in front of the other every day and continue that walk. 
and continue to grow and continue in your purpose for my life. And so when it says, walk worthy of the Lord, we have, we have a frame of reference for that because we know what Christ did for us. And now he's left us on earth as his representative and we're going to continue to walk that spiritual walk one foot in front of the other and walk with purpose. So I want to give some concluding points on the doctrine of walking. Some concluding points. The Christian way of life is not standing still. You'll want this in your notes. The Christian way of life is not standing still. You see, you're either advancing or you're retrogressing. Because the soul, you say, well, I'm living on truth. I, li I learned 20 years ago, Brad. I'm just, I'm just living on what I got. No, you're losing every day. You lose what you don't use. You lose it, and it has to be replaced. And that's why we have repetition. Repetition, repetition. We teach it over and over again. And you hear it over and over again. And so we see that the Christian way of life is not standing still. It is a forward motion, always taking forward progress. And so forward equals walking. And that's why the analogy is used, because in walking, you're making progress. And isn't it amazing that we talked about in walking, you have to throw yourself off of balance to actually make a step. And the Christian way of life is the same way. You've got to have faith. You've got to have trust in the Lord. And from one step to the next, you don't know what's going to happen. But you're totally trusting. You're using the faith rest drill as you go forward. There is a term in the Bible called weak knees. It's used in Hebrews in Hebrews 12 about the believer under discipline. He has weak knees. He's slumped down. He's, he's under the load of discipline. And it says to strengthen weak knees. And so when we're out of fellowship and we're not positive towards Bible doctrine, and uh, we may be pursuing our own goals out here. Guess what? We get under divine discipline, and we're not walking forward. And so we are to bind up. We're to strengthen. We're to rebound and get back with the program. Under the filling of the Holy Spirit, We are high stepping. Here's funny. I was never good in athletics. So when I joined the athletic system at, at uh, Arkadelphia, I was not good at basketball. Any country boy knows you're not good at basketball because all of our basketball courts were built on either dirt or gravel. And so when you bounce the ball on unlevel ground, it'll bounce over there. When it hits a hole and it hits a crawdad hole, it just goes over there. When it hits a rock, it'll go over there. So we, we didn't dribble. Hey, you, you can't dribble the ball out on the gravel Hollywood, uh, the gravel basketball court out at Hollywood. So we learned how to just carry the ball and just go for the hoop. Well, that doesn't work when you go to try to join the basketball team. So I was no good at basketball. I, I didn't make the team. I couldn't dribble. Man, I couldn't bounce that ball. I can shoot it okay, but not that good. So I said, well, I'll try out for the track team. And so I got out and ran. And I ran. And I ran to the best of my ability. And I just, I really, you know, I thought I was fast. But the time clock said I wasn't. And I never could break a seven-minute mile. About seven flat is about the best I could do. And, uh, you know, I said, well, 
I'm just average, but I couldn't make the track team. And then I uh, wasn't really big enough to play football, real skinny. And, um, but I worked out. So in, when I joined athletics, I would try out for the team knowing I wasn't going to make it. But I worked out. I, I, I stayed with the team. And we worked out, and they would haul us out uh, many times to wash a car or whatever. Well, there was a hill right across from the Washita Stadium. If you look at those driveways over there, there's some big houses, there's some big driveways that go up there. And the coach would take the football team and he would run us up and down that driveway. And uh, many times they had a golf cart and they would sit on the golf cart sipping Gatorade and they'd get us out there and say, all right, boys, we're gonna work this hill. Y'all take off, run, high step it up that hill. And I, I actually had an advantage because I was used to running through the woods and uh, I could go up those hills pretty good, like kind of like a billy goat. And so I, man, I, I could make it up that hill and it would come back down. And some of those big guys, they didn't like the hill very good. But one of the terms that our coach would teach us, he would say to us, pick those feet up. Pick those feet up. I want you to high step it. I don't want to see those toes dragging. I want you high stepping. And it's the same application in the Christian way of life. When we're in the bottom circle, we don't have a problem high stepping, using that energy uh, that the Holy Spirit gives us to perform the duty. And so weak knees under divine discipline, high stepping in the bottom circle. Jesus is on point. Deuteronomy 31 6. When we walk in the Christian way of life, Jesus is the point man. I want to read Deuteronomy 31 6 to you. It says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. This is the people that they were facing battle. For the Lord your God, that is Jesus Christ, Jehovah Elohim, He is the one who goes with you in my Bible. Actually, the Hebrew term is He goes ahead of you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And so many times in the Christian way of life, we may be saying to ourselves, this is hard. I don't like going through this point in my life. But we fail to notice that Jesus is forging the path ahead of us. He is knocking down the brush. He has busted the holes for us. And Jesus is on point. And so he'll never leave you or forsake you as you walk forward, no matter how bad the situation may seem to you. To walk with the Lord is to enjoy life to its fullest. And this is a principle that many of us know but cannot be put into words. You know what it's like to walk with the Lord during your day. I have one small principle that I use in my in my work. When I'm working in my shop, every victory that I have during the day, whether it be minuscule and small, I stop and I say, thank you, Lord. 
I get that valve seat driv driven right down in that head and it's a snap fit. Thank you, Lord. Because it's by wisdom that He founded the earth. By doctrine. Every small victory. When you're walking with the Lord, you can stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. And when we walk with the Lord, we can enjoy life. Now, you have, you have to have your own application to this point. I, I can't even put it into words. And this is to be occupied with Christ. And so there's some concluding points on walking. We're going to switch gears and go to our next phrase here in just a moment. Of categorical information, and we've been stopping at each new phrase, each new word, to review that category. We have a new phrase. Our last phrase was that ye may walk worthy of the Lord. And our next phrase is fully pleasing Him. And so we need to look at this for just a moment. And we're going to go on to our next category. How can we be fully pleasing to God? As a young person, you develop a, uh, a way of thinking. If you're going to please somebody, uh, many young people, they start uh, looking at the opposite sex. They start looking at uh, other people, and they develop an opinion of what is pleasing to the eye. And uh, I don't have any. I've got a couple of young men here. You may look at one young woman, and you may say, well, she wears a pink ribbon in her hair every day and she's got blonde hair and blue eyes and it is very pleasing to me that is what I like I like to see pink ribbons and blonde hair and blue eyes and you may develop the opinion that the Lord looks down at us the same way and that if he looks at us and we're uh, good looking or we fit his uh, uh, criteria of what we should look like then we're pleasing to him well that is absolutely wrong absolutely because jesus christ died for every member of the human race that would ever live each one having a soul of equal value to the lord what doesn't matter what race doesn't matter how many limbs they're missing doesn't matter if they fell out of the ugly tree and hit every limb on the way down. The good Lord uh, looks at them the same way. And uh, we have a problem in the human race. And, uh, in my family, there's a problem. It's called Arianism. It was the same thing that Hitler came up with. That somehow you're going to examine someone and you're going to critique them on... Uh, how they look well the good lord made us all different let me tell you and we've got to stop critiquing people uh judging people on how they look and so we definitely know that that is not one of the criterion on how we can please the lord how can we please the lord let me tell you the the first ultimatum you cannot please the lord without bible doctrine See, I just slew a bunch of folks with that phrase. You can't please him without Bible doctrine in your soul. You cannot. At birth, you died spiritually because every cell of your human body was contaminated by the sin nature. You died in a status of spiritual death. And you lived that way until you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and then God imputes His very own righteousness to you. You became a royal family member. 
And so this is the first step in the process of pleasing God. Let's just put this process here. We'll start out with plus R. Moment of salvation. Still not yet fully pleasing to Him. We could use a lot of different illustrations here. I'm going to use the issue of super grace. When we break into gate 5 and 6 of divine dinosphere, that level of spiritual growth where we have a grace mental attitude, where we understand the RMA, the impersonal love towards the human race, and then a personal love towards God, we break into a new plane of thinking. It's the grace mentality. And so, fully pleasing God means you are thinking doctrine like He thinks. We've developed a spiritual walk. Uh, we we could have put in uh, we could put in different things here. We could start out with plus R. We could go to the filling of the Holy Spirit. Um, we could go to uh, the super grace life and go on. But this is what it takes to be, I'm going to put, fully pleasing God. It takes thinking divine viewpoint, thinking like God thinks. And how do you do that? The intake of Bible doctrine. You've got to have the function of gap in your life. You've got to take in enough truth to be able to think divine viewpoint and pleasing Him. And so it's not a lot of work you're going to do. It's not a certain amount of money you're going to do. It's not some kind of religious concept that you're going to fulfill that is pleasing God. It is the what you think. Now I want to go on. It says, being fruitful in every good work. And so we're going to look at divine good in the Bible because our phrase says being fruitful in every good work. Fruitful is the Greek term karpo foreo. Karpos is the word fruit. Foreo means producing or production. And so to produce fruit, we have to remember that much of the Bible is written because there is an agricultural economy in place in the time when most of the Scripture was written. I like this. You know why? Because most of the, some of the greatest pastors I have ever known were raised on the farm. They weren't. I never forget how Dr. Vaught would talk about. He was teaching uh, me, I was listening to a tape. Uh, I don't even know how old it was, 20 or 30 years old. And it was talking, he was talking about the doctrine of walking. And he was talking about getting up before daylight. He worked on a, a dairy farm. He had a lantern that he had light every morning. And he would walk out from the house, uh, I think he said he got up about 4.30 every morning, and he would walk out from the house and he would put one foot in front of the other, not being able to see beyond the step that he was making with the little lantern he had, and he applied it to the doctrine of walking. But he talked about getting out to the silage. They had a big grain silo that they put silage in. It was kind of like molasses, sorghum molasses, but they uh, cut it for cows and he would take and throw that silage down out of the uh, silo down to the dairy cows well you have to understand that much of the bible is based on agriculture 
And when you have somebody that comes out of an agricultural background, they have certain scriptures that are open to them that the guy in the city doesn't have. And so this is the reason I think sometimes when we see our pastors of the past who grew up on farms, they have a insight into the Word of God because many times it is based on agriculture. Carpoporeo means fruit producing. This is the verse we looked at a week or two ago. Proverbs 8.19, it says, My fruit, that is the fruit of Bible doctrine, is better than gold. Yes, than fine gold or refined gold. And my revenue, my your investment into Bible doctrine, than choice silver. I'm talking about the production of Bible doctrine in the life. Romans seven four talks about fruit. Therefore, my brethren, that is born again believers, you also have become dead to the law. That means you no longer live under the Mosaic law. It was your husband back here, but now you're married to a new one. You have become dead to the law. Your old husband died. Through the body of Christ, your new uh, location is that in the top circle, that you may be married to another, your new husband. I've never taught this before. I just realized I've never taught Romans 7. That your new husband that you're married to is him who's raised from the dead, that is Jesus Christ, that we should bear fruit to God. And so our new location that is in Christ, our new identification with his death, burial, and resurrection, that we can bear fruit to God. Then we have a second term that's used in the Bible for good, divine good. The first one is fruit. The second one is agathos. We're talking about divine good. Remember also, I didn't put down the fruit of the Spirit is divine good. Galatians 5. Agathos here is the word we have for good many times in our Bible. Agathos, in most cases, the definition, good of intrinsic value. That means good no matter where it's at. You can take a gold ring. You can take a gold ring right now and you can put it around a beautiful lady's neck and it is it's accentuous, especially if you put a little cross on there. There's grace grace and more grace when you put a cross on a woman and so it's beautiful it's gold but you can take that same gold and you can put it in a pig snout has it lost its value in the hog's nose no even though it's not nearly as beautiful and graceful and guess where it's going to go it's going to go in the mud isn't it that's what hogs do they root and so gold has a intrinsic value no matter where it is. Well, agathos, that is divine good, also has an intrinsic value no matter where it is found. We have a, another term that's used in the Bible. It's kakos, many times translated evil. But the definition is actually intrinsically worthless. So if you have Confederate money from the Civil War, Confederate paper money, guess what? It may be a cool collector's item. It might be something you could put in a museum. You might even be able to sell it on eBay. But you can't go put it in the vending machine. You know those vending machines that have a little thing up there? You try to put that Confederate dollar bill in there, it's not going to take it. You can't buy anything where it's intrinsically worthless. And so that is... Kakos, evil, and we're going to see that human good is intrinsically worthless. There are three kinds of good mentioned in the Bible. 
See, all good is not good. All good is not good. That would be some good basic Bible doctrine. There is human good. Genesis 3-7. Operation Fig Leaf. The humans knew they were naked. They sought out clothes. The clothes were good. They covered their bodies with them. But it wasn't the plan of God. Big leaves won't work. Your own self-righteousness won't work. You've got to have the blood of Christ and Jesus Christ Himself killed the animals. He made the first leather outfits for Adam and Eve. And human good, the first act of human good is Genesis 3-7. We know human good. Isaiah 64-6 is God's attitude towards human good. He views them as filthy rags. We see a lot of human good in the world today. We've seen it in the past couple of weeks. The terrorists who bombed Boston were on welfare. You may say welfare is good. But welfare, we're feeding the lion that's about to be loosed from the cage to kill us all. We've made the lion strong where he can crunch our bones. Can you see that? Human good in the world. It does no good. Religious people love it. Go drill a well in Africa. Go give them clean water so they can be nice and healthy and feed them. And in Africa, you've watered the, the man and you've given him food and you've fixed his teeth and he goes out and he rapes babies because they believe that if you have AIDS in Africa, it's been taught that if you'll rape a baby, it will cleanse you of your AIDS. See, you've done great human good by giving him a well. He should have dried up. He should have starved. He should have thirsted to death out in the desert. Human good is not, all good is not good. Right now, we've seen uh, our technology go to Egypt. They're getting our fighter jets. They're getting our tanks. For some reason, they're supposed to be our allies. Except the Muslim Brotherhood is the way of government there, and they're totally against Israel. They'd like to see Israel annihilated. And while we've given them weapons under the pretense of being allies with Egypt, we understand that in the tribulation, the kings of the south will invade Israel seeking plunder. And so all good is not good. And you could go on and on and on. And this is what people don't understand. You serve in the soup line. Let's, let's keep going here. See, I, you're not into this, but we can talk about it. You're serving in the soup line. You're giving the homeless guy a nice... Preston, you killed the deer and you gave it to hunters for the hunter. You're out hunting. You say, I've got extra venison. We're going to give this to hunters for the hungry. Hunters for the hungry donates the venison, the best protein you can get, to the soup kitchen. You're out on Thanksgiving. You say, man, we're going to, and when you serve that big bowl of hot soup, it's below freezing outside, and you give this homeless guy a big bowl of that hot venison stew, and uh, he gets Full, his belly's full, he gets warmed up, and now he can go out in the middle of the night and he can break into your neighbor's house and steal all of their uh, guns and all of their things because you fed him in the soup line. Can you see that all good is not good? And so the issue is, we're going to find out the issue, the good that you produce needs to be under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And if you're not led of the Spirit to produce that good, it may be human good. There's a second category of good in the Bible. It's establishment good. When we follow the laws of divine establishment, we produce good, and it is a good that is good in time. It has no value in eternity, but it produces a lot of good in time. 
It is for the perpetuation and protection of the human race, the orderly function of it, which we have to have to resolve the angelic conflict. And so we've given the four divine institutions. Number one is freedom or volition. Right now, we understand under freedom, you're free to make choices. You're free to build a bomb and blow people up. Yes, you are. But guess what? You're free to get ripped bone from bone, arm from arm, limb by limb from people who are mad because you blew up their families. Yes, you are. To face the death sentence, however terrible it may be. Now, we see that volition is hindered because uh, even though we have murderers and they're not being put to death, they're being kept alive by your tax dollars. Right here, freedom is under attack in the United States. This is personal responsibility for your decisions. Marriage between a man and a woman. The right uh, parameters within which uh, sex is. Family. The right uh, location, the right habitation for raising up children with a man and a woman, a husband and a wife and children under the parents' authority. I'll never get through this document if I keep preaching here. So we'll go on. Nationalism, patriotism, free market economy, capitalism. And so all of these things produce a kind of good that is good for the human race. It's good for a nation. It's good for the people in the nation. But it is locked down to time. It doesn't have any effect on, uh, you can't have any reward because of it in eternity. And then the third category of good is divine good. And that's our passage, Colossians 1.10. And if you need a short definition of divine good, it is that good produced under the leadership of the Spirit. That good produced while in the bottom circle. So we're going to look at the doctrine of divine good. The production of divine good is impossible by the human race. We're talking about unsaved mankind. We look at Romans 12:21, it's impossible for an unbeliever to love like a believer does. The love that the believer has unmerited, is wrought of God. The Holy Spirit sheds His love in our right lobes. In Revelation 20 at the great white throne, we see that no unbeliever will pass judgment because of all the good He has produced. He cannot produce one thing that will keep Him out of judgment. A believer in phase two is the recipient of grace, and that grace is designed for the production of divine good. Ephesians 2.10. I'm going to read this verse to you because it's often distorted by the religionists. Go back to Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10 reads like this, For we are His workmanship. I love this. Because if you're a craftsman and you've ever built anything, you can think of a project that you've built and that you put all your prowess into and that you've made great. Well, God, we are His workmanship. We are His project. And His projects come out good. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, that is, in the new position, in Christ, for good works. Now here, we have the word agathos. And it is agathos good. It is divine good. 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The grace apparatus for perception is the means for production. And so you say to yourself, well, I want to produce some divine good. Well, I need to go out. I've got to go out and do something. No, you got to hit play. Because God uses prepared people. You may feel all fired up about doing church programs, going out and doing this and doing that, but I'm going to tell you what. You're going to find out all good is not good. All good is not good. Gap is the means for production. 2 Timothy 2.21. Read that with you. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared, for every good work, prepared believers. Also in 3.17, that the man of God may be complete. Artios, it means spiritually mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is the mature believer. How do you get become mature? Through the function of God. Titus 2.7. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility. And so gap is the means for producing divine good, not going out, not getting involved in all the programism. Therefore, production is a grace principle. Second Corinthians nine nine. In Colossians 1 15, 1 Corinthians 15 10, excuse me. These are verses on giving, and it talks about freely we've been given, by grace we give, and uh, by grace we receive, and by grace we give. Being able to produce divine good is a sign of stability in your life. Second Thessalonians two seventeen. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So we have stability and divine good. They are a package. There are three sources of divine good for the believer. The filling of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit's work in your life. I had to stop and say, if you'll recognize none of this has anything to do with you, not how great you are, not how good you are, not how good looking you are, not how much you work, not how much you do, not how much sleep you lose, has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with grace. And divine good is a grace principle. The second source of divine good is the human spirit. As you function in gap, the human spirit eliminates the truth. We call it pneumaticus. And under faith, it's trans. Transferred to the right lobe of the heart. And also the edification complex of the soul. When you have that structure inside your soul, you have a buckboard for producing divine good. We're going to look at the edification complex later on. Only two more points. Divine good is the basis for reward at the beam of seat of Christ. Second Corinthians five ten. One of the great beam of seat passages.
Second Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, Bema, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good, agathos, or bad, not sin, not harmatia, but kakos, intrinsically worthless. Jesus Christ is never going to mention one of your personal sins at the Bema Seat of Christ. If you have some human good, it's going to get uh, thrown into the fire and burned away. It's not harmatia, it is kakos. And so divine good is the basis for reward. The resolution of the angelic conflict re requires divine good. John 15, this is one of the greatest passages on divine good in the Bible. Especially for the church age believer. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. So you're, well, we're talking about a vineyard here. God the Father is the one who's going to take care of the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And so we have the picture of the believer in carnality and perpetual carnality and reversionism. It's like a dead limb. What did Pastor Small tell you about trimming the blueberry bush? Get rid of the dead ones. Get rid when you're clipping those blueberry bushes, the ones that don't have any, blue, uh, any green leaves on them, the dead limbs, you clip those off. And so it says in this picture that God the Father, the believer that's in carnality, in reversionism, he's got locked in negative volition, God the Father clips that believer off. He cuts his appointed time short. He calls him home to heaven. He dies the sin unto death. And he's taken out. And he's turned to the side. Now, here's the bad thing. You say, well, if I'm, if I'm uh, producing divine good, man, I'm going to get fertilized. I'm going to get treated right. I'm going to get water and fertilize and you're, because I'm so great. No, he's going to clip you too. He's just not going to clip you off. He's just going to shave you down. And so the pressure of uh, testing is going to propel you. We call it momentum testing in your life. He's going to prune you. Verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. In John 13, Jesus taught rebound. He talked about staying in fellowship. And so if you want to produce some divine good, the first principle you're going to have to find out is how to stay in fellowship. Verse 4, abide in me. That means stay in the bottom circle. And I in you. We're never commanded to stay saved. You have to know in verse 4, this is stay in fellowship. And I and you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. That means if you're not in fellowship, if you're not in the bottom circle, it doesn't matter how much good you do, you can't bear fruit. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I him in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. That means all your good is human good, and it's energy of the flesh. It is nothing. Verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and he is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. And this is a picture of your human good being burned at Bema. If you abide in me, and you're in my words, that is, my doctrine abides in you, 
You will ask what you desire in prayer, and it shall be done for you. And so we have the believer who has the correct prayer life. He's praying with divine viewpoint. And that concludes point number eight. The resolution of the angelic conflict requires divine good. When we produce divine good, it glorifies God in the angelic conflict. I should conclude. I've, I've kept you a long time today, but I have to give you some concluding, a, one, at least one concluding principle here. If you want to produce divine good, do you know what you have to do? Not go and do. Not get busy for Jesus. You know what you have to do? You have to prepare and relax. Prepare and relax. And then God brings you whatever in your life where you will produce that. Whether it be the person, whether it be by lips, whether it be by life. And so we prepare as believers, and then we relax. And when you do that, it's like shooting the duck off, two, off the water at two paces when you get ready to produce divine good. I want to thank you today for your attention and your attendance.